Science favors empirical evidence, which means reproducible results. For example, one study that claims it found no bacteria in a urine sample, while numerous other studies trying to reproduce this experiment discover bacteria in the urine demonstrates the first study was a fluke, whose conclusion was likely due to intellectual dishonesty. Whether purposeful or not, intellectual dishonesty means normal standards of investigation were not met, which produced results at odds with the norm. Falsificationism is the idea that it is impossible to verify that beliefs about universals or unobservables are true, though it is possible to reject false beliefs if they are phrased in a way amenable to falsification. It is an inductivist approach to knowledge production that basically asserts that theories cannot be proved but that theories or hypotheses can be disproved or falsified. Essentially, falsification means we can only verify things which are able to be tested. Falsifiability is then an important and necessary element of any scientific theory. We cannot be confident about the conclusions we draw in our decisions if we start with a certain belief and refuse to change that belief, even when presented with evidence that demonstrates our belief is incorrect. Now people often confuse the meaning of the word falsifiable with meanings for false or falsified. It is important to not make this mistake. An assertion that is falsifiable can be true or false, and through observation it can be verified to be one or the other. Things which are not falsifiable are not able to be observed to determine if they are true or false. This is a simple concept but a necessary one, as the scientific method can only be applied to things which are falsifiable. This is an important distinction and an area where many sociological fields fail as they attempt to apply a pseudo-scientific method of inquiry to subjects that cannot be falsifiable. What is not science? I must be certain that you can recognize what the scientific method is and differentiate it from the kinds of things that masquerade as science by using its vocabulary. Additionally, it is important to recognize that I myself have defined chivalric humanism based on my own theories, background, knowledge, and values, but the difference here is that I do not claim chivalric humanism to be a science. It is a framework of morality, in which scientific knowledge is used to bolster its validity. But as it is primarily concerned with morality, it cannot be a science, nor do I claim that it is a science, which is why I have written at length on what science is and is not. I encourage people to be able to distinguish science from non-science, because chivalric humanism does not hold the answers to all of life's questions. It can only supply answers to moral questions. Thus, chivalric humanists should employ the scientific method to address non-moral issues. Now, there is a lot of nonsense masquerading as science. These are studies that have very short durations or that have intentionally small samples so as to be actually statistically insignificant but presented otherwise, all tweaked for the sole purpose of creating nonsense to be published in journals of questionable standards. The goal is for the so-called scientists to pad their resume with the appearance of groundbreaking studies. This is all pseudoscience and it is sadly far too commonly practiced in my time. In my experience, many journalists and journal editors are very interested in public welfare and view anything that has the potential to attract readership as good for publication, even if it is predicated on faulty reasonings. You must therefore learn to identify real scientific studies from pseudoscience to prevent becoming deceived by unscrupulous writers seeking to profit from ignorance and gullibility. Pseudoscience is usually detectable when the researchers do not follow the scientific method, do not provide falsifiable predictions nor conduct any double-blind experiments. A common example of pseudoscientific research is when the author creates reports that have the appearance of statistical significance but are in fact utterly meaningless. For example, they may create a poll study involving 100 participants and apply the results of this study to a billion people in spite of the fact that 99.9% .9 of the people the report conclusions are being applied to were never studied during the research. While a researcher may try to claim their research is still useful, if one merely considers a so-called margin of error, the problem is that margins of error are only a mere mathematical conclusion that represents the number that was not surveyed. Margins of error cannot be evidence that something is true or untrue among a non-observed number of people, and a low margin of error does not validate research which does not meet scientific standards of inquiry. If there is even 1% of a population that is not surveyed, it is simply non-scientific to assume this population segment's answers to a questionnaire will be the same as the 99%. You may feel strongly compelled to believe something is or is not the case based on a margin of error, but when you do such a thing, you are not employing science. Most importantly, and as mentioned in the first section of my book, 
People's ideas are not consistent natural forces of the universe in the way that forces such as light, gravity, and heat are. The latter will behave in predictable ways according to their principles, and the former, a person, is free to say one thing yet do another, or even change their opinion entirely as swiftly as they had first settled on it. This is why I say it is a pseudoscience to pretend to be able to measure people's opinions as accurately as one can measure natural forces of the universe. Humans may be part of nature, but our opinions are far more malleable than natural forces are. The bulk of things that masquerade as science happen to label themselves as social sciences. They claim to be a science, but are actually based on Auguste Comte's positivism. Comte, who invented the term sociology to begin with, believed that societies of humans must follow natural laws the same way that natural forces such as gravity and heat operate. Positivism dominated the field of sociology for most of the 20th century, and even today is still common among contemporary sociologists. They rely heavily on quantitative research and develop mathematical models from these data sets. Alas, the data is often poorly collected and therefore produces results that cannot be reproduced, which inherently makes much of their work not scientific. It is from their roots as positivism that the sociology branches frequently employ a bastardized version of the scientific method to rationalize things like the surveying of 100 people and projecting these results to apply to millions of people who were never surveyed. This is not science, but merely a kind of statistical voodoo that wraps itself in the language of science, much like how astrology uses the language of astronomy to appear scientific. Yet the scientific method is specifically designed to investigate the natural world which can be observed. While we can observe people's actions, we cannot observe their thoughts. There is no method for reliably measuring human thoughts, at least none which has been invented in my time. Today, most sociological research is conducted on college campuses and uses volunteer students who are required to participate in these studies as a means of obtaining credit in social science-related degree programs such as psychology. This is known as convenience sampling, which is highly vulnerable to selection bias. The practice is widespread because researchers often have difficulty funding the research necessary to get diverse samples of responses and have decided that even non-scientific research is better than no research, thus creating institutionalized volunteerism into the student body. But this is not science, and it is important to recognize that it is not science. When you read these reports, you must keep in mind that the research methods employed do not support the conclusions the researcher is making due to the existence of selection bias as well as other failures to fully apply the scientific method in the experiments they conduct. While it is true that it is important for students to gain experience conducting studies, the problem is these pseudoscientific studies are often published, and the students themselves often cite the studies in later papers they produce, which creates the present state of academic incest we see in many sociologist circles where people are taking findings from a small group of students and trying to apply these findings to the whole human population. The kind of science we commonly see reported on by the popular news is almost entirely made of this kind of non-science, which many individuals in the general public assume are factual based on the credibility of the newspapers, news television shows, and the universities themselves. And so many people do asinine things like drink wine believing it will make them smarter because they once read a three-paragraph write-up in a magazine about how a college study showed people who said they drink wine daily did better on some multiple-choice test than a group that said they drink rarely. These kinds of studies are often guilty of the logical fallacy of post hoc ergo propter hoc and other false equivalence fallacies. What I am saying here is not novel. These problems are well known with the sociological branches of academia. For example, the paper estimating the reproducibility of psychological science was published in Science Magazine, Vol 349, issue 6251 on August 28, 2015. Science Magazine is the peer-reviewed academic journal of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. The paper pointed out that from 100 selected studies published in top psychology peer-reviewed journals in 2008, less than 30% of these studies could be reproduced by others. Additionally, in the article 1500 Scientists Lift the Lid on Reproducibility, by Monia Baker, published in Nature Magazine, Vol 533, issue 7604 on May 26, 2016, the results of a poll to the magazine's readers reported that 70% of the magazine's readers had failed to reproduce at least one other scientist's experiment, including 87% of chemists, 77% of biologists, 69% of physicists and engineers, 67% of medical researchers, 64% of earth and environmental scientists, and 62% of all others. 
while 50% had failed to reproduce one of their own experiments, and less than 20% had ever been contacted by another researcher unable to reproduce their work. Furthermore, few of the respondents had ever attempted to publish a replication, and while 24% of those who had attempted to do so had been able to publish a successful replication, only 13% had published a failed replication. Several respondents that had published failed replications noted that editors and reviewers required the paper's language to be altered to play down comparisons with the original studies. This widespread problem of producing research that no one else can reproduce yet becomes heavily cited in other research papers is well known among sociologists. This problem is referred to as the replication crisis. These non-reproducible studies can become heavily cited and used as the basis for other meta-analysis research, such as observational studies, spreading even more pseudoscientific ideas among the public as they become cited by newspapers and social media content creators. In light of this information, it would be more beneficial for students to learn how to make accurate studies rather than being instructed in how to conduct pseudo-studies that do not adhere to the scientific method and teach bad habits. That the scientific method is financially inconvenient does not excuse teaching pseudoscience as if it were science, especially if they are going to base the practice of medicine on the results. Genuine scientific research should only use surveys as part of the research phase to help form a hypothesis, and they should then conduct a real experiment to prove or disprove that hypothesis. Instead, it has become commonplace for the data gathering phase to be presented as an experiment and for the hypothesis to be presented as the conclusion of an experiment when no actual experiment, per the standards of the scientific method, has taken place. That is not real science, it is nonsense.